Um, so it was a blessing. We appreciate having you, Joe. Colossians chapter 1. We're going to read verses 15 through 23. So if you'd like to follow along. Great passage of Scripture starts with verse 15. It says, He, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Listen to verse 21. And you, he's talking about us, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. This is God's word. Joel Hogberg, would you come and would you pray for us before we have the message this morning? Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you are God, that you are almighty, that you are all-powerful, that you know all. And we are thankful that no matter what, that when the world seems to be falling apart around us, we know that you are in control and that you are the one who puts everything together. We are thankful for that today. And I pray that through your word that we would listen to it and that we would hear it, you would speak to us and that we would be able to make your supremacy personal in our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. We are in our fourth week here of our series on our church mission statement, and today we're going to talk about what is not only the center of our mission statement, if you look at it, it's the center phrase, but really what is the center of our faith, what is the center of our theology, and that is Jesus Christ himself and his supremacy in our lives. So if you would, I'm going to show you here on the screens the mission statement. Read it with me again, would you? Driven by the gospel and supported with prayer, we exist to worship God authentically, enjoy Christ's supremacy, cherish Scripture mightily, care for each other passionately, and reach out tenderly with the saving message of Jesus Christ. Thank you. How many of you enjoy a good cup of coffee? Okay, you can put your hands down. I do too. Let me ask you this. What is your favorite? Like, just call out. What's your favorite kind of coffee? Black. Black. That is so vague. Thank you. I mean, what's your... Black, okay. But, I mean... Jamaica me crazy. Jamaica me crazy? That's a coffee? Wow, okay. That explains a lot, I'll tell you. Um, Yeah. How about... What else? What do you like? Toasted Southern. Toasted Southern Pecan, okay. How many of you like Starbucks? Not a lot of... Look, they're all, your daughter's like the only one in you. You've influenced her well, buddy. Good job. Um, some people like, so how many of you like, uh, we're in Minnesota, how about caribou coffees? A lot more like that, okay. Me, I'm a Dunkin' Donuts man. I like Dunkin' Donuts. I grew up in the, in the Northeast and Dunkin' Donuts is everywhere. And the first cup of coffee I ever actually enjoyed was a Dunkin' Donuts cup of coffee. There's a story that goes along with this I'm not going to share with you. But um, 
but I do enjoy a good cup of coffee. However, when I grew up, how many of you ever heard of Sanka before? When I grew up, now, young people maybe have no idea. When I grew up in New Jersey, I'd go to these diners and, or, or, or things like that, and there were always, I don't know why, but it, was all, it always seemed like there was an old lady that was saying, give me a cup of Sanka, honey, you know, and, and, and I, just, I didn't know what that was. I didn't know exactly, you know, some kind of a brand, but I found out, of course, you know, if you know what it is, it's decaffeinated coffee. Is it instant too? Okay, I didn't know, but it's decaffeinated too. And to me, decaffeinated coffee just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's kind of like, some of you may like it and that's fine, I mean, to each his own. But to me, it's kind of like Christianity with Christ. It just, there's no point to it. Well, as a, without the caffeine, right. Well, Christianity without Christ makes no point and neither does caffeine. But understand this. And, and as I came to, to this message this week, as we've gone through these messages, you know, the messages have been a little, bit, a little bit more topical than usual, but with a passage kind of supporting it. But when I came to this message this week, I thought there's just a passage of Scripture that absolutely perfectly describes what the supremacy of Christ is, and it's Colossians chapter 1. This book, of course, if you know, was written uh, to combat the Gnosticism that was, that was prevailing during the first century. And the key verse in the entire book is Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, which talks about the preeminence of Christ. And that word preeminent literally means to be first in rank or influence. And it's been translated in different English translations as preeminent, like it is in the, in the ESV, supremacy, chief place, or I think the NIV calls it first place. But the idea is that this, that Jesus Christ is supreme, and the supreme person and the supreme theme of the entire Bible is Jesus Christ himself. In fact, you could say it this way, Christianity is Christ. That's what it's all about. The Old Testament, the entire Old Testament, records the preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ into our world. The Gospels present him as God in the flesh that came to save sinners. The book of Acts is a detailed account of how the message of Christ began to spread around the then known world. The epistles detail the theology of who Christ is and, and what he is to be in the church. And the book of Revelation presents Christ as sitting on the throne as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Every scripture that we look at points to Jesus Christ. And Jesus said as much to some very religious people in, who were Jews in, the, in John's gospel. And, and I really like how this comes across, and particularly the Amplified Bible. He says this, Jesus said to them, You search and keep on searching and examining the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And yet it is those very scriptures that testify about me. Now, again, in Colossians, Paul was dealing with some false teachers. And false teachers very often seek to bring down Christ from being on the level of being equal with God. And, and they, they want to make him appear as nothing more than a man. The false teachers in Colossae were trying, they weren't denying the importance of Jesus necessarily, but they were denying who he really was. And they wanted to dethrone him from being God in the flesh. Kent Hughes said this, and I put this on the screen because I think it's really worth looking at. He said this, he said, Seeing Christ as he is will keep us from heresy. For it will fortify us against the scaled-down Christ which has captured so many lost hearts. In other words, theologically, knowing who Jesus is is so important. But notice the next sentence, he says, And it will cause us to begin to love him with a real love. My fear for a lot of modern day Christianity is the Jesus that is being presented is not the Jesus of the scripture. And the love that they feel for this false Jesus is false. And so finding out who he really is is critical for truly loving him, for truly enjoying him as the supreme Lord and ruler of all. See, Christ is not only the supreme person in the Bible. He desires to be the supreme person in our lives. So the question for us is this. How do we enjoy Christ's supremacy? 
How do we enjoy that? Well, this passage kind of details how we can do that. The first thing is we can do that by enjoying his place in creation. In verses 15 through 17, it talks about how Jesus is first in God's creation. The term firstborn he uses. And that doesn't refer so much to time, like coming before it, but, but it refers to place, it refers to status, it refers to first importance, first in rank. So the firstborn of all creation means that he is the Lord of creation. See, Jesus is not a created being. He is the eternal God. John 8, 58, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And by saying that, Jesus was saying, I am God. See, Jesus is the creator of all things. Verse 16 says it this way, By him all things were created. And so when you, when you understand that, when you understand Jesus created all things, is it any wonder that when we read in the Gospels, we see that the wind and the seas obeyed him? I mean, when he said, peace be still, they stopped. I mean, you go ahead and try and do that. It's not going to happen. Is it any wonder that these diseases that people had just fled away when he commanded them to? That death itself could not stand before him when he said to Lazarus, come forth, and immediately he rose up from the dead. Why? Because he is the master of all things. In fact, John 1, 3 says it this way, that all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. You know, we marvel at, at incredible structures that have been built. I don't know how many of you have been to the, the Viking Stadium downtown, but it is an incredible structure. I mean, it is just an amazing thing to behold. And we, we look at even things that are ancient, and we say, how, how did they build the pyramids? You know, people wonder. But honestly, all those things are incredible. But when you go out into God's earth and you see that which God created, when you look up into the heavens and see the universe before you and you see that God created all of that, while the buildings are cool, they pale in comparison to what God has done. So I read a story about a journalist. His name was Henrik Van Loon. And the first time he ever visited the Grand Canyon, he said this afterwards. He said, I came an atheist, I left a believer. Why? Because the heavens declare the glory of God and we can see the work of his hand and his creation. He's the creator of all things. And, and, and understand this, if he created all things, then what that means to us is that he created you and me. I believe the Bible teaches what is called special creation. And that simply means that God created humanity in a special way. The Bible says he created us in his image and after his likeness. And if you read the account of the book of Genesis, you know, it, it's incredible. You read all these things, and, and I've, I've taught that to kids and, and things. And, you know, Janine this year got this really cool thing to teach her preschoolers about the days of creation, and they had different things written out. It's really neat. But if you look through that whole thing, what you see is this. God says, let there be light. God says, let there be this. God says, let the animals appear. God says, let this. Somewhere along that... Along that line, he made a platypus, which is really cool, you know. Um, but he says all that, and then he says, let us make man in our own image. After all, and the Bible says, he, with his own hands, made man out of the dust of the ground and created him. What an incredible picture of God creating humanity, creating us. And what that means is that when we're created in his image, it means that we matter. It means that humanity matters. That's why we hurt and we cry and we weep and we have such anguish when we see something like that happened this week in Las Vegas. Because there are people God created. And, and it, it bothers us and it ought to bother us. But what it means is this, that God designed us. And folks, we can trust him. He knows exactly who we are. One of, the, one, of the, one of the good things in my life that God has done is helping me, and I don't mean to sound like a pop psychologist because that's not the point, but helping me understand who I am. And by that I mean what my strengths are and what my weaknesses are. And understanding there's just some things I can't do. What a freeing thing to know, I'll have to take the burdens of the world on me. And to understand that God made me. And God is the one who created me and, and gifted me. And if I use the gifts he's given me, and if you use the gifts he's given you, then you know what? We can live the life he wants us to live. 
So he's the creator. But not only that, Jesus is also the sustainer of all things. Verse 17 says it this way, in him all things hold together. In other words, he is the glue that keeps everything together. He is the one who not only created it, but makes sure that it doesn't fall apart. He holds everything together. There was a guide who took a group of people through an atomic laboratory and he explained to them in detail how all matter was composed of rapidly moving electrical particles. And so they studied these molecules, these models of molecules, and they were amazed to learn that matter is made up of primarily space. And so during the question period, one visitor asked, okay, if that's how matter works, then what holds it all together? And the guide had no answer for him. But do you realize as a follower of Jesus, we do have the answer? We know that it is him that holds everything together. It is Jesus Christ. He made all things. He controls all things. And by him, all things hold together. In fact, look at this verse in Hebrews. It says it this way. Speaking of Jesus, he says, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So, how does this help us, his place in creation, help us to enjoy him? Folks, as I said when I, in the announcements, when it seems like life is falling apart, because doesn't it seem that way sometimes? Doesn't it seem like sometimes you just wake up and you're like, what, what is going on? When it seems that way, we can know that he can hold it together and we can trust him. He holds this universe together and if we will let him in our lives, he can hold us together and keep us faithful in following him. So enjoy his place in creation. Secondly, we can enjoy Christ's supremacy by enjoying his place in the church. See, he's not only first in creation, he is first in the church. And, and, and that is absolutely true when we think about the church worldwide. We know that Jesus is the ruler of the church. But sadly, if we're honest, we know that that is not always the case inside of the local body and the way things come to pass. Richard Halverson was the former chaplain of the United States Senate, and he wrote these words. Listen, he says, In the beginning, the church was a fellowship of men and women centered on the living Christ. Then the church moved to Greece, where it became a philosophy. Then it moved to Rome, where it became an institution. Next, it moved to Europe, where it became a culture and finally, it moved to America, where it became a corporation. That's incredibly insightful. Folks, please understand, remember, the church is not an organization. We're not, we're not like the Lions Club or the Kiwanis Club. The church is Christ's body. It is a living, spiritual organism of which Christ is the center and of which everything should flow from him. And so the scripture teaches us in this passage that Jesus is the foundation of the church. Verse 18, it says this, He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That term beginning means, again, first power or originator. It, it has the idea that the church is built on one thing and one thing alone. It is built on the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 16. He said, On this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so, understand, the reason that the church has grown and thrived in our world the way it has through the centuries is not because of the sanctity of its membership. It is not because of the creativity of its leadership. Rather, it is because the church has one foundation, Jesus Christ. It is His church. So years ago, Samuel Stone, who was an Anglican pastor in England, during the 1800s, he, he's known for writing a famous hymn. and the, the, the hymn is called The Church is One Foundation. Probably many of you have heard it, but listen to these words. They're so fitting. He writes, The church is one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. It is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. Listen to this next verse. The church shall never perish, her dear Lord to defend, to guide, sustain, and cherish is with her to the end. 
Though there be those who hate her and false sons in her pale, against or foe or traitor, she ever shall prevail. Why? Because it is his church. Because he is the center of it. And he, the scripture says next, is the head of the church. He's not only the foundation, he is the head of the church. It says in verse 16, he is the head of the body, the church. The truth is, I was talking about this in my, my membership class this morning, and it's so refreshing. You have to understand, the, and I never understood it until I was here. Even as a youth pastor, I didn't really quite understand it. But the way that we operate as churches, being a pastor of a church, is, is such a unique and in some ways such a strange thing. And, and the way that some people view the pastor's role in different churches is so weird because I was raised in, in kind of this idea. I didn't think it was good, but I didn't know anything else. Where it's kind of like it was top down. The pastor's here and everybody else is here. And whatever the pastor says goes. And if you, if you don't like it, well, you can just go. And I know that's not healthy and that's not good. But it, it, it is a strange thing to think about the responsibility of being a church. And a lot of people, they say this to me sometimes. Well, I like your church. And I know what they're saying. You know what I mean? And and I feel like saying sometimes, well, thanks, you know, I painted the walls and I uh, built the, it's not my church. But what we have to understand is this, that no person on earth is the ruler of the church. Not the elders, not the pastor, not the deacons, not the pope, not even the congregation. Although we are congregational in our membership and we're congregational in the way that we rule, we are not the head of the church And the psalmist captured this truth so well when he wrote, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. G. Campbell Morgan once wrote, That the church of God, apart from the person of Christ, is a useless structure. I mean, isn't that just true? Without Jesus at the center. He would go on to say, however ornate it may be in its organization, however perfect in all of its arrangements, however rich and increased with goods, if the church has not revealing the person of Jesus, lifting him to the height where all men can see him, then the church becomes an impertinence and a sham, a blasphemy and a fraud, and the sooner the world is rid of it, the better. So the question for us is this. So what is the church's job? What are we supposed to do? What are our march, marching orders? I mean, is, it, is the church supposed to just kind of circle the wagons and protect ourselves from this evil world? Is the church supposed to somehow Christianize our country and have a Christian government? Is that the role of the church? Well, our primary jo- job, according to Jesus, is this. To go and make disciples of all nations. Matthew chapter 28, verse 9. In other words, we are to lift him up We are to lift Christ high that others may see him and come to know him. In other words, like our mission statement says, we are to reach out tenderly with a saving message of Jesus Christ. Now listen to how one man did this. In 1893, the World's Exposition was held in Chicago. More than 21 million people visited the exhibits at this fair. And among the features, they had what was called the World Parliament of Religions. And so representatives from all the world's religions came to kind of share their best points and perhaps design a new religion for the world. Well, D.L. Moody was there, and he saw this as a great opportunity for evangelism. So he used churches, he rented theaters, he even rented a circus tent um, when the show wasn't on. And his idea was to present the gospel of Christ. But a lot of people wanted him, they wanted him to attack the parliament of religions, but he refused to do it. And what he said was this, He said, I am going to make Jesus Christ so attractive that men will turn to him. He knew that Jesus was the preeminent Savior and not just one of many religious leaders in history. And so it was one of his greatest campaigns of all time. Thousands came to Christ. Why? Because he simply lifted Jesus high and God drew people to himself. That is our role, to lift high Jesus Christ, to enjoy his place in the church. And lastly, we enjoy his place in the Christian life. You see, Jesus is first in creation, he's first in the church, but he desires to be first in our lives also. And remember, that word preeminent means first in rank and influence. And so it's the idea that Jesus is not only supposed to be our king to whom we submit, 
But as disciples, he is to be our teacher from whom we are constantly learning to navigate life as we go through this world and to live it his way. So notice how Paul describes the, our lives in, in this passage. I think it's a, a neat progression. In verse 21 through 23, he speaks first of all of our former state of alienation from God. He says, you were alienated and hostile in your mind. That word means estranged or separated. While God created us in his image, and we need to understand that, we also understand that sin separated us from him. The Bible says that over and over and over, that our iniquities have made a separation between us and God. And that explains why when we preach the gospel, we understand that unbelievers have to repent. In other words, they have to change and turn to Christ before we can be saved. I was talking this week with our men's Bible study on Thursday morning, and we were ex I was just explaining why I never want to minimize the role that sin plays in the message of the gospel. And I know people like to do that. But please understand, if we're all basically okay, then what in the world reason was there for Jesus to come? See, if we understand how awful sin is and how it completely separated us from God, then folks, then we will begin to understand how amazing the grace of God is how we don't deserve it, how it is truly a gift of his grace. It makes us grateful. We were alienated from God. Ephesians says we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We we're alienated from God. Here, understand this. So then he talks about our current state, and that is reconciliation to God through Christ. He says, you, he has now reconciled in the body of his flesh by his death. No one ever reconciles themselves to God. God took the initiative. He did it in his love and in his grace. The Father sent the Son to die in our place so that sinners might be reconciled to God. Jesus died for us when we were without yet strength, Romans says. When we could do nothing of ourselves. When we were still sinners. Even, Romans says, when we were the enemies of God, Christ came to save us. And so, folks, we can only be in a right standing with God because of what Christ did never because of what we did and you know what if that were the end if we stopped right there we said boy we were alienated from God and Christ came to save us if that was the end of the story then we could say praise God from whom all blessings flow but like those stupid infomercials that come on we could say wait there's more <laughs> see Paul also talks about our future and that is a state of, listen to this, glorification in Christ. There's a time when he will present us holy and blameless and above reproach before him. We know that all of God's children will one day be with him. But, but listen to what John wrote. Listen to this verse. He says, beloved, we are God's children now. It is a present possession. We are part of the family of God. But he says, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know this. That when he appears, we shall be like him because we will see him as he is. In fact, our future in Christ is so secure that the Bible tells us, Romans 8, 29 through 30, that we've already been glorified. God sees it as completed. And all we're waiting for is for Jesus Christ to return and reveal his glory when we will be with him face to face and we will be like him. And folks, here's what I'm trying to get across. Our relationship with Jesus Christ can be the most exciting, fulfilling, and meaningful relationship we've ever been involved in. If we will simply give him his proper place, and that is first place. We can only enjoy Christ's supremacy when we realize he is Lord, he is sovereign. We submit ourselves to him, his place in the church, in the Christian life, he's supreme. And we ask ourselves these questions. Who's in charge? Jesus or me? What proof is there that God controls my life? Have you ever asked that question? What proof in there, is there in my life that God is in control of my life? I'm going to close with a story. That can also be said this way. Are we following Jesus? Is he in control? I think I see Ina and Mar France over there. Show this next picture if you would. This is Ina... And Marv's grandson, I'm going to tell you about, uh, his name is Alex France. And um, 
He's a runner. If you look up at the picture, you see the guy in blue. It says Millard North. He's a runner. And then there's a guy in a weird-looking yellow shirt in front of him. I'll tell you why, why that is this way. Alex is a runner. He, he loves to run, and apparently he's a very good runner. Um, I just learned this from Ina this week, and she showed me this newspaper. I said, I've got to take that, Ina. I've got to use that. He's got an eye impairment called retinitis pigmentosa. And um, if you ask me to spell that, I can't. Um, but it's a degenerative eye condition. It especially affects his peripheral vision. And so he's a runner. He's a good runner. And I think he's a senior this year. Is that right? He's a senior this year. So this is the big, I mean, senior year is the big deal in sports. But his eyesight has, condi- has gotten worse and worse. In fact, last year, as I read the article, he actually, in his running, ran into a tree. He's run into fire hydrants, tripped in holes because his eyesight has gotten so bad. It's even hard. Sometimes he can't see people coming at him to shake his hand. So his coach put an ad in the paper for, um, he wanted someone to be a guide runner for him. And so she wasn't sure anybody would answer or if this was even possible. They had to meet with the high school sports authority and make sure it was okay. But this guy in the yellow shirt, his name is Tim Grundmeyer. And he answered the ad. He was not only a high school runner, but he ran in college. And he's just graduated. He answered the ad. He became his guide runner. Now let me explain what that means. So you can see the guy in the yellow shirt, he runs in front of him. He literally runs the race in front of him and in practice as well. And what he does is he surveys the land. He surveys the track that they're running on. And he helps him to prepare. He yells back at him to prepare. There's a turn coming. Um, or, hey, there's a dip coming up. There's a low spot. Watch out for the tree. Watch out for the, 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 the street uh, curbs that you have to jump over or fire hydrants. All those things that could possibly really hurt him. He calls back and says, watch out for that. So that this guy can run on the track that has been laid out before him. Now think about that for a minute. Is that not what following Jesus is? Jesus, the almighty, sovereign God of the universe, sees everything there is. And he is supposed to be out in front. He sees all the landmines. He sees the things that will hurt us. We are called to follow him and to listen to him. We can't see. I mean, we're, we're all ignorant of what's really going on in life sometimes. But if we will follow Jesus... In fact, let me, let me show this verse. Does this not perfectly fit with these verses? The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How? Looking to Jesus, the guide runner, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The question for us is this, are we following Jesus? I often pray this prayer. I was telling somebody this week. I say, God, I don't want to be out in front of you, but I don't necessarily want to be running behind you either. And what I mean by that is I don't want to lag behind where God is going. But as I thought about this this week, I thought, you know what? Maybe I should change that prayer. God, I do want to be behind you. I want you to be out in front. I want you to be seeing, and I want to follow you. When we do that, we can enjoy Christ's supremacy. And you know what? We can find rest in him. He sees it all. And he is Lord. Let's bow for prayer. <clears throat> Today we talked about Christ. We talked about Jesus. We talked about what he's done for us. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior... Maybe you're here and you say, you know what, Pastor, I don't know where I stand with God. I really don't know um, where I am. But I want you to know Christ came to save you. 
Christ came to save us. And if we will turn to him as our Lord and Savior, he can not only give you eternal life, but then he becomes supreme in your life and you can follow him. If you're like me and you say, well, I received Christ many years ago and I, every day I'm trying to figure out how I'm supposed to follow him in this world, then I would encourage you to remember he is preeminent. He is supreme. It is his world. It is his church. The scripture says we are his and we are called like Alex France to run behind him and to listen and to follow. And when we do that in our community we can enjoy Christ's supremacy. God, thank you for your word and the power of it. Thank you for this passage in Colossians. Lord, I, I confess to you that I fail. There are times I run ahead of you, times I try and call the shots, times when I think I'm the guide runner. But Lord, your word says that you are preeminent. You are the creator of all things. You are the firstborn. You are the preeminent one. So, Father, forgive us when we try and do life ourselves. May we learn to truly be followers. May we learn, God, to let you be out in front, knowing that you will protect us, you will guide us, you will show us what we are to do and where we are to go. And, Lord, may we rest in that and enjoy that. Father, we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Stand with us if you would. We're going to have a song, but I think before the song we have an announcement. Maybe after. Oh, we have an announcement here. Okay. Don't you love it when Kim makes an announcement? This one okay? Yeah. I like to keep him on his toes. <laughs> he gets a little worried. It's that time again. It's Christmas in October, and that's the time where we uh, give some gifts, monetary gifts, and some cards to our missionaries that we support. And there's four of them on the board right now. Jonesy's, the Rissers, the Dr. Pat, and Lydia Gwill. Those are uh, four of our missionaries that we support here as a church. And there's a beautiful display over here that you can write a little note to each of these um, um, missionaries and and just send uh, and and there'll be a little box too if you there it is over there Joanne is showing you and um, go ahead and write a little note to them there's a place for any monetary gifts that you would want to put in on the little um, lantern over there so don't forget to do that and uh, so we can as a church just uh just support and encourage our missionaries that are out in the field over christmas time so we'll collect now so that they could have a extra christmas gift this christmas thank you let's all stand Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust to Jesus' name. Christ alone, God. 